Hello everybody, Dr. Gillard here. This is kind of a warm-up video. We're getting into the lung diseases now. And I just cut all these slides out because we never have enough time to talk about disease. So you're supposed to know all this stuff already. But here's a quick overview just in case you're rusty. So it would behoove you to go over this anatomy, histology, a tiny bit of embryology review of the respiratory system or the respiratory tomatoes tomatoes respiratory system respiratory system I say respiratory system it's the summer of 2020 here we go what is the respiratory system I hope you know this already uh, it's a system that allows us to breathe air in and breathe carbon dioxide out right the cells in our body need oxygen to stay alive and in the process of utilizing oxygen, carbon dioxide is formed, and that is poisonous. we got to get that out of the body. And that's what the respiratory system is all about. And blood vessels and hemoglobin, of course, are take a lot of this oxygen. They carry, a, not all of it, but they carry a lot of the oxygen and carbon dioxide to the microcirculation of the lungs, and that's where gas exchange, specifically at the alveoli level mainly at that. It's not completely at the alveoli level, but mainly at the alveoli, alveoli level. So the respiratory system, the basics, what is, who are the players? We have the nasal cavity up here. Uh, we have the pharynx, which is broken down into a nasal pharynx. Uh, we have the oral cavity. It's usually not included, but I mean you can breathe through your mouth, so I guess it really should be included. But the oral pharynx, laryngeal pharynx, laryng uh, larynx itself, and then you go into the trachea, and then the tracheobronchial tree, and then the the small unit, the acinar unit is one AKA for it, respiratory bronchioles, alveoli bronchioles, and alveoli. Here's kind of a better look at that nasal cavity. There's the nasal pharynx. Right at the soft palate is where the name change occurs. We get into the oral pharynx. Right at the epiglottis, we get the, the tip of that we, becomes the laryngopharynx. And then don't go down the esophagus. You know, if you're food, you go that way. But if you're air, you go this way. And the larynx, then you go into the trachea itself. The end of the larynx is right below this cricoid cartilage here. And that starts the trachea. This is also a dividing point, this glottis, you remember this. Anything this direction, upper airway problem. Anything below the glottis, lower airway problem. Embryology. Everybody's, oh no, not the dreaded embryology. Yes, the dreaded embryology. So week four, we just completed folding our beautiful trilaminar disc into a round tube. And now that's the classic tube within a tube body design. And we created a gut tube, right? And that's basically our esophagus, our stomach, all our intestines, our rectum. And that gut tube was created, the inner layer was created with endoderm, and the outer layer was created by specifically mesoderm, but specifically lateral plate mesoderm, even more specifically splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. That's a huge board question, huge embryology one right there. What is the, the gut tube? Or what is the esophagus? Where was it derived? Where was the stomach? Where was the intestines? Well, the, in, the inner part, the lining of the all of those things is derived from endoderm. And the outer covering is derived from lateral plate mesoderm. Okay. So what happens is, up in the foregut, we get a, a anterior bulging of this tissue, uh, and that's called the respiratory diverticulum, or the lung bud. And that is going to be the primordial tracheobronchial tree in lungs. So here's kind of what it looks like. Here's the foregut. And we had, at first, we had a little bulging, and then it started to grow down like this. And this is the respiratory diverticulum. This is the straight part. Of the respiratory diverticulum here but the whole I mean the whole thing is the respiratory diverticulum and you have two parts once it it starts to form you have a straight portion and then you have these primary bronchial buds 
uh, that come off to the right and left. And you, you can imagine that's the trachea. There's your going to be your primary bronchi right there. And those are going to uh, bud again. More little buds are going to come off them. And you're going to go, you're going to start working your way through the tracheobronchial tree. You're going to grow the tracheobronchial tree. All right. Uh, so the primary bronchial buds, they ultimately form the right and left bronchi, main bronchi, a.k.a. main stem bronchi, as we said. Uh, so there's a beginning of a, a bud, a lung bud, right there. You can see it's already starting to split, but now it's split quite a bit. Those are the bronchial buds. And then now we have some other buds coming off the bronchial buds. And it goes, those are secondary buds. Uh, and the secondary bud, I mean, it keeps going like that until the whole tracheobronchial tree is created. And interesting, here's a fun fact I bet you didn't know. When the, when the baby is born, its lungs are only about 90% mature. And they mature very slowly. You're actually still growing buds and the Asini is developing up to the year of uh, the age of eight. Cut all the molecular biology, we don't need to go into that, but I will tell you the star of the show here is something called the Hox gene. The Hox gene has to be turned on in all this tissue or it won't form the lungs. All right, so here's seven weeks in, and we can see it's, ah, it's there's a trachea, there's a left and right primary bronchus. We can see the lobular bronchi have already formed, right? There's two lobular bronchi, and there's three lobular bronchi here. And we can even see some segmental bronchi starting. You remember all these branches? We'll go over them again if you didn't, but some fun embryology facts. So the, pulm the bronchopulmonary segments of the lung, remember that those are segments. They're, they're they're walled off by connective tissue and that's the smallest part of the lung that you can do surgery on. So those pulmonary segments which are fed by the uh, segmental bronchi feed those things. Uh, they're formed uh, between week four and seven. Segmental bronchi which feed the, the bronchopulmonary segments they grow into those bronchopulmonary segments between wake week 8 and 16 and the basic pulmonary artery system also goes in during that time. Respiratory bronchioles which is the first part of the respiratory division the part that where gas exchange really occurs those aren't created until week 17 to 26. The alveoli type 1 or alveoli specifically type 1 alveolar cells and type 2 alveolar cells. So those are all, uh, t well, I mean alveoli, type 1 and type 2 make up the alveolar wall. Uh, so those guys are created between week 26 and birth. At week 26, type 2 alveolar, cell, alveolar cells, they're really important. Even though they don't make up that much of the bronchial wall, but they're the ones that secrete surfactant. And surfactant will line the inside of an alveoli and make it so it won't stick together, first of all. But more importantly, it, uh, it, it reduces the surface tension. So you need reduced surface tension in order for gas and carbon dioxide to move through, even though they're super thin layers of epithelium you still have to have a, this surface tension deal working. So surfactant is super important for that. I already said 90% formed at birth. What does the respir respiratory system even do? Uh, well, gas exchange we talked about. Condu uh, condition of the air. It conditions the air so it humidifies and warms your air. The air has to be a certain, have a certain humidity and a certain warmth. Filters the air to the best it can. You like you have nose hairs, right, that try to filter stuff out. And you have a mucus escalator that we'll talk about, so that's really important. And speech. The air passing through the vocal cords gives you the ability to speak, and it assists with smell, olfaction. OK. 
Okay, meet the lungs, tracheobronchial tree. Basic of the lungs, so here's a nice PA radiographic, the PHS film. See the heart silhouette there, looks nice. Those are some nice looking lungs. There's those costal phrenic angles that are so important. So of course, basic ABCs, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. Specifically, the right and left leg lung both have an upper and a lower lobe. The right lung has an extra lobe that is called the middle lobe. So that's a little bit, a little bit different. Does the left leg, uh, left lung have a middle lobe? Eh, kind of. It's got a little stubby little thing called the lingula, which is kind of a rudimentary left lobe. All right, you guys know all that. Beautiful picture here. See the trachea. You could see the bronchial tree kind of embedded in the substance of the lung. So here's the right upper lobe. We have a horizontal fissure that isolates that. So you could get a lobar pneumonia that's isolated just to the upper lobe. Here's the middle lobe. That's an oblique fissure. So the middle lobe is between, that's our easy board, soft question, softball question. The middle lobe is between blank and blank. Well, it's between the oblique fissure and the horizontal fissure. And then the right lobe we have here, or the right lower lobe is just down here on the bottom. We have the base of the lungs here, or the diaphragmatic surface, or diaphragmatic surface. The apices of the lung is up at the top. All right, we're good with that stuff. So the tracheobronchial tree, the, often called the conducting airways, because there's not much gas, no gas exchange occurs in the tracheobronchial tree. You have to be below the level of the terminal bronchioles before gas exchange occurs. So all these pipes are, their only purpose is to bring gas out, CO2 out, and oxygen in. Okay. And we already said the tracheobronchial tree, as we saw, it lives in inside, embedded in the parenchyma of the lung. That parenchyma is actually going to be very important. Trachea, 10, mil, 10 centimeters long. It is about 2.5 centimeters, about an inch thick. Normally, its job is to conduct air from the lungs as well as help condition the lungs. It's got part of the mucus escalator as well, so it does have a clearing function as well. Specifically with regard to location, it's from the inferior part of the larynx, specifically the inferior crical cartilage, to the carina of the trachea is where it travels. Or you could say it runs from C6 to like the T4 disc level, T5 to T the T4 to T5 would be exactly where the T4 disc is, and T6 would be uh, standing. They're both board books, right? That's Student Gray's author. And that's the big giant Gray's standing. So they're hopefully they'll stay away from a board question like that. And let's see, trachea ends at the level of the carina, so it splits into the right and left primary bronchi or main stem bronchi, some AKAs. But this last little piece of it here is called the carina. Histology. So the trachea and a lot of the, uh, like the lobar bronchi, segmental bronchi, even some of the bronchioles, they have all these layers. Uh, there's some differences, though, that we'll look at. But the trachea... Uh, here's an overhead view of it. Here's the front. Here's the back where the esophagus is. So it has a mucosal layer, so to, or mucosal layer, submucosal layer. And then interestingly, it has a cartilaginous layer, which we haven't seen before, and then an adventitia. We don't have any muscle, smooth muscle yet, but that's coming. It's made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. It sits on a lamina propria, so those cells, and there are goblet cells that are distributed within these epithelial cells as well, as I just, we said a little while ago. 
the only real star of the show with regard to the submucosal layer, there are submucosal glands which secrete mucus. The cartilaginous layer, which is unique, there's a whole bunch of these C-shaped cart like horseshoes almost. The horseshoes are opened in the back and they're closed in the front. It's an important thing to understand. And they don't they are they're interspaced. There's connective tissue in between these. You see these when you get into the lab. Uh, but they're open in the back, but they they do have the tracheallis muscle, which is very important. That runs between these things in the back and kind of kind of closes the circle. Tracheallis is actually important. Remember that one from your physiology? Um, that one, when you swallow, it relaxes because this esophagus, here's a big piece of steak going down. Uh, it relaxes and bulges inward. So when you swallow something big, it actually decreases the diameter of your, the lumen of your trachea. Okay, so that's interesting. When you cough, if you got if you swallowed something down the right wrong pipe, there's a maybe a piece of food that you choked on. The tracheolus constricts really hard, and it by con, by pulling the horseshoe together, it decreases the uh, the area of this pipe. And if you decrease area, you increase the velocity of your coughing air. So it makes the air. I forget what it is, like what, 120 miles an hour or something? It like blow, tries to blow it right out of there. So that tracheallis muscle is important. There's three types of cells in this mucosal layer that we should look at. We've talked about these a couple times. Ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells, the main type. Each cell is filled with those little hairs. It's not one little hair. It's 250 cilia on average. And that's the key player in that mucus escalator, a.k.a. mucociliary escalator. Uh, what's the job of the mucociliary, mucociliary escalator? It's called mucociliary clearance is its job. In other words, dust particles, viruses, bacteria that you've inhaled down in your tracheobronchial tree, that's got to be removed. And we'll talk about toward the end of this presentation about how the mucus is like flypaper and it traps all this stuff. But there's two layers of mucus, a thick layer and a thin layer. And the thin layer is enough to stick to the thick layer, but not thick enough to stop the cilia from sweeping it forward. So it's a very cool system. There's, as we said, there's goblet cells. There's uh, stem cell-like basal cells, very similar to the stratum basale, the basal cells in your skin. And they sit on a lanum appropriate as well. So what holds the trachea open? There's no there's there's no parenchyma of the lung to hold it open. Well, it's these cartilage. These are very stiff. This hyaline cartilage holds it open. When you take a huge breath, the pressure becomes very negative inside this tube. Uh, and if it wasn't for these these rings of hyaline cartilage, your tube would collapse. So it's very important for that. There's about 18. Here's kind of the design of it from the front, these horseshoes. I don't know why they have, this is really isn't correct to have one like that. They're all, they're all horseshoe shape like that. There's about, on average, there's about 18 of these things. Um, they're called tracheal rings, made up of hyaline cartilage, we said. And uh, they're open toward the posterior where the tracheallis muscle covers them. Okay, now we said the trachea at the carina splits, uh, and let's talk about how it splits. In fact, it branches about 23 times into smaller pipes, smaller pipes, smaller pipes. That's called dichotomous branching. Each tube usually splits into two daughter tubes. Here's the hierarchy. It's an important concept here. There's 23 divisions. Ground zero is the trachea. The first division is to a right and left primary bronchi. Then you're going to have lobular bronchi, three on the left, two on the right. And then you're going to go into the segmental bronchi. Then you're going to go into bronchioles, a whole bunch of divisions of bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles, there's even a couple divisions of terminal bronchioles. And that is the end of the conducting airways. 
because once you get down into here, these last three amigos, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs, this is where gas exchange occurs. So these are like respiratory, uh, the respiratory zone, or I used to call it the asiner zone, but I, our board books don't call it that, so I'm going to try to get away from that. But we'll get to that. So here's everything I just said. Primaries split uh, into lobulars. Lobulars split into segmentals, a.k.a. tertiaries. <clears throat> it's these. Here's a nice board question. The segment, who supplies the, the super important cone-shaped bronchopulmonary segments? It's the segmental bronchi. The, probably the board question wouldn't say segmental because that gives it away. It'd say tertiary, tertiary bronchi. Remember, bronchus is a tube that's singular. If there's a bunch of tubes, plural is bronchi. All right. Uh, on the left, on the right side, most authors say there's ten of them. On the left, it's anywhere from eight or nine. Some authors say ten as well, so it's a little more variable on the left. Then we get into the bronchioles. So segmental bronchi finally get small enough to divide into something called a bronchial, specifically segmental bronchi. Or no, that's what I just said. Segmental bronchi branch many times within the pulmon uh, bronchopulmonary segments and become even smaller tubes called bronchioles. Bronchioles branch and branch and branch and branch uh, until they finally get down to something called a terminal bronchial. Terminal bronchial is the last, as the name implies, it's the last division of the bronchial tree, and no more. It's the last division of the conducting airways as well. Right? Here's just kind of a, a pulmonary bronchial segment. Uh, we've already went, uh, went through this, but you can see the uh, all the different segmental bronchi here. Uh, let me count these up. There's 10 of them on this side. I think there's 8 on this side. Right? We don't do much the, this much anymore, but uh, this is called a bronchiogram where you inhale like a contrast material and then you take an x-ray and your your tracheal bronchial tree is lit up like a light bulb uh, and that's called the bronchiogram. Now you just order a thin slice CT nowadays. Very uncomfortable procedure like you're choking. It feels like you can't get air. But it sure is a pretty picture. And you can also see, I think we'll get to this in a second, but look at how straight this one is. That right main bronchi is very straight, or the left one uh, is not so straight. Therefore, if you get swallow something in the wrong pipe, it can go right down into the the bronchial tree itself, and it's almost always on the right side that occurs. Let's look more closely at this. So, uh, the main bronchi again. Here's some AKAs. Principal bronchi standring. The board book ca calls them principal bronchi main stem bronchi, primary bronchi, main bronchi, so there's a lot of AKAs for those. And yep, they they the terminal portion of the trachea splits into a right and left main bronchi. Histology uh, of this region, similar histology to the trachea, only the cartilage rings are not horseshoe shaped. They're complete circles around the main bronchi. They're still lined by the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. There's still lots of goblet cells there. Now we have something new. So smooth muscles start showing up for the first time. And it's deep to the lamina propria. Remember we had the mucosal layer, then lamina propria, then submucosal layer. Now we have a smooth muscle that's shown up, smooth muscle fibers show up between the lamina propria and the submucosal layer. So that's a little different. And this smooth muscle is going to be with us a long time. As the tubes get smaller, they become filled with more and more smooth muscle. And let's see. So these main bronchi, they are for a while they're naked they're not in the substance of the lung but as they get ready to about midway through they actually dive into the meat of the lung or the parenchyma of the lung 
and they go through a special structure called a hyla. Okay, hylum is singular, uh, hyler region, so hyler would be an adjective, right? So we don't, I always, I have trouble with this because I learned hylus, uh, but we don't use that term anymore. It's, it's hyla for plural and hylum for singular. Um, but that's also called the root of the lung is where the, the hyla is, or the hilum is, singular. I want to keep wanting to say hylus. They dive into the substance of the lung, so does the pulmonary arteries, veins, lymphatic vessels. They dive in as well. And there's a picture. Of course, the lungs would be you know, like that. But there they are. You can actually see where all these big pipes are going in. It stops the photons and x-ray, so it makes this a little, a little bit, uh, gives it a little bit of whiteness here, little radiolucency. So you can see that on an x-ray. Can you guys see it? Can anybody see it? Yeah, right there. Right. So these are the hyler areas. Yep, nice x-ray. Okay, this is interesting. I just thought, where, where, where my, what is this doing in here? Um, so this is a guy who got one of those, uh, some kind of a cabinet, and he was building it, and all these little pieces. Uh, and his little six-year-old grabbed one, or four-year-old grabbed one, threw it in his mouth, choked on it, went down the wrong pipe, if you look real closely, you can see it. It's actually stuck in the right main bronchi, or bronchus. Because you can follow. See the trachea? See the air shadow? I'm going to ruin this by drawing it, but you can back it up. See the trachea? It goes right there. I can hallucinate it in. And then the other split probably go like that. But this, it's lodged in that main bronchus on the right not easy to get that out that's oftentimes they have to do surgery to cut that thing out and that's not an easy surgery can't you can't cough that out usually i heard somebody thinking that all right uh, so the right bronchus is uh, it's wider but it's shorter and it's more vertical it's more like an extension of the trachea all you can think of it as but that's why if something's going to get stuck if you're going to if you're going to aspirate something Right, or if you're gonna choke on something, it goes down the wrong pipe, is what the layperson says. That's gonna end up in the right main bronchus. Splitting of the bronchi, as we said, uh, they split the right and left bronchi split into a right and left main bronchus. Or I'm sorry, the right and left main bronchus split into the superior lobar bronchus, the middle lobar bronchus, inferior lobar bronchus, aka is secondary for all those. So those obviously go into the lobes, the three lobes of the lung. We've said this already. The main bronchi splits into two pieces. A superior, we'll call it secondary bronchus this time, inferior secondary bronchus. Lobar is the word that's usually used here. So here's our trachea. Here's the carina. It's splitting. The artist didn't quite draw this vertical enough, did he? Uh, so he kind of messed up on that, but nevertheless... Uh, it shows us the carina splitting into this. So this is all uh, right up into here. That's all the right main bronchus, right? And then it gives off three lobar bronchi, one right here, one right here, and one right here. So that's the, the right superior lobar bronchus, the middle lobar bronchus, the inferior lobar bronchus. This side's much easier to see because you just have one pipe and it splits into two pieces, the superior and inferior lobar bronchi. Got it? Segmental bronchi, you can see each one of these lobar bronchi split. Specifically, the superior one splits into three pieces. Uh, the middle splits into two it looks like three pieces as well. Comes out to ten. Okay. Um, yep. Arguably, again, ten on the right, eight to nine on the left. Segmental bronchi. 
these are the ones again that supply and they could call them tertiary bronchi. These tertiary bronchi supply the all important pulmonary bronchial segment. Right? If you have a tumor, a cancerous tumor, and it's in a pulmonary bronchi, a pulmonary or a bronchopulmonary segment, you can do surgery on it because you can take that segment out. It's encapsulated. If the cancer has spread between different bronchopulmonary segments, really, really bad. It's it's hard to get it out if it's been able to go through these the walls. Uh, histology. We still have cilia. Um, so we have we have a mucosal layer, submucosal layer. We have a cartilaginous layer. Those are all still there. Uh, the smooth co muscle content is increasing now, though, as we go. Uh, content is decreasing. There, the cartilage content is getting less and less. So now you're thinking, well, how come? What about the negative pressure? Is that getting less and less? No, it's not. Uh, it's actually quite strong. We'll we'll show you what the fix is for that. Here's a very busy diagram. Memorize all this stuff. I would never make you do that. In fact, this is just a warm-up. You should have this already. I don't think physiology teachers went into this detail, but I think if you know exactly the level I'm teaching at right here, I think you should be good. Uh, but those are what all the segmental bronchi. And remember, the segmental bronchi are going to split now in a second. And they split. The next one down is the bronchioles. Right? Segmental bronchi becomes smaller and smaller, still within the bronchopulmonary segments of the lungs, uh, but they get smaller into the bronchioles. And once something hist histologically happens, once you're small enough to become a bronchiole, you don't have any more hyaline cartilage. It's gone. So there's nothing holding the tube open when you take a deep breath out, air in and that pressure becomes negative. Why don't the bronchioles crunch together? because you don't have any hyaline cartilage. So that's the $64,000 question. Does anybody know why that is? Well, first of all, they have a lot more smooth muscle. So smooth muscle gives it some resistance, but still not enough to collapse. Now the key is the parenchyma of the lungs. Parenchyma of the lungs has attachments to the outer part of the tube, and it literally holds the tube open. And that's called radial traction. So radial traction, the parenchyma imparts radial traction on the smaller airways to hold them open. It's a super important concept. So here's a bronchial right here. Uh, there's no cartilage in it. And just here's all the substance that's sitting in the meat of the lung, the parenchyma of the lung. And the parenchyma of the lung is tons of elastic tissue in it that attaches to this outer wall and it's springy. It wants to contract all the time. So it literally holds that airway open. And it helps it from collapsing during inspiration when things get really negative. Now, emphysema, which is one of the COPDs, chronic bronchitis and emphysema are the two CO, the COPD subcategories. COPD destroys the parenchyma of the lung, amongst other things. So what if I destroy this? What's going to happen when you take a breath in? It is going to collapse. Your bronchioles are going to collapse and you're not going to get oxygen downstream from that. So tons of alveoli, there'll be blood, red blood cells going to dump off the carbon dioxide, which they do, but there's no oxygen to replace it. When you breathe out, maybe you can get the carbon dioxide out, but you can't get the oxygen in and that is a big, big problem. Okay, everything I said, they lost their cartilage. Um, they've also gained a lot of smooth muscle. The cilia and the mucus escalator and the goblet cells are also kind of petering out uh, at this level. And the cells are morphing from columnar into simple cuboidal cells. Finally, we get to the terminal bronchial. So these are the uh, terminal uh, bronchioles. These are the smallest of all the bronchioles and this is it. This is the end of the conducting system. So super high yield to know what terminal bronchioles are. Don't get them confused with respiratory bronchioles because that's what they split into. But this is the end of the conducting system. They're very very muscular. Think of them as arterials. Cross-section of them 
you know this this would be all muscle here they're super thick they're just like arterioles so that muscle by the way I'm not going to get crazy in the physiology but that muscle uh, has some connections and that muscle has the uh, wire connections and it has the ability to contract and this is the problem with people with with asthma they get a spasm of these muscles and it literally contracts these terminal bronchioles and the other bronchioles for that matter down to nothing and you can't breathe and they literally suffocate to death if something isn't isn't done in a severe asthma attack all right so that's the end of the conducting airways there's also a new cell type that we see for the first time these are called clara cells so this is another thing that helps with helps the radial traction keep these things from open um, so clara cells secrete a lipoprotein called surfactant uh, and that's the same that type 2 alveolar cells secrete that keeps the lung from the alveoli from collapsing and sticking together and that is secreted there as well and it it encourages them not to stick together if they do collapse down and it also plays a really important role in uh, regeneration after the injury has occurred so bronchial regeneration they're really small they're only 0.5 millimeters in size they have no cartilage so they're collapsible they have tons of smooth muscle though but they're held open by radial traction uh, the cilia are almost gone by this point as well in fact by the time you get to the the respiratory part the respiratory bronchioles cilia is gone the tr the mucus escalator is broken at that point and I don't know why I put this in again here but here it is again radio traction emphysema patient no radio traction this collapses talked about that already all right finally we're down to the respiratory bronchial so this is the smallest uh, member where gas exchange occurs and it marks the beginning I'm trying to take this out because I don't want you to learn this because asiner system some texts call it but that's not what the board books call it uh, but it marks the beginning of the pipes that that gas can be exchanged at right so that's another good board one you got to know the respiratory bronchioles so we're gonna call it not calling it the asiner unit anymore or the asiner system we're just going to call it the respiratory unit. That's what Guyton calls it, which is a long-time board book, super fa famous. So respiratory unit is what we're going to call it. But asiner unit, asiner system, respiratory acini, terminal respiratory unit, respiratory unit. Did I have that twice? Yep, I did have that twice. Uh, the so-called respiratory lobule. X radiologists love this term. That's super, super old. Don't use it really anymore, but you'll see it in radiology. Respiratory lobule. They mean this last, these last three amigos. We're going to meet the three amigos in a minute. And this is where gas change occurs. CO2 is removed. O2 is put into the blood. And it's, where is it? It's created by the terminal bronchioles. They split into at least two respiratory bronchioles. Now, how, do, how can you tell a, re, a terminal bronchial from a respiratory uh, bronchial? How do you tell? Uh, because you're going to have a few alveoli coming off, all of these. So to be part of the respiratory unit, right? to be a respiratory bronchial, which is the first part, you're going to have a tube like this. It's going to split to alveolar um, tubes. But you're going to have single alveolar sacs coming off this tube. Once you see that, you know you're in the respiratory bronchioles. The terminal bronchioles don't have any alveoli on them. So that's the way that you tell. Okay, so there's got to be some. So let's meet the respiratory unit and the three amigos so we have the respiratory bronchioles that's the first pipe there's not many alveoli coming off those but there's still some 
Then we have the alveolar ducts. There's still not a ton of alveoli coming off these. These are more airways, uh, but there are some alveoli. And it's not just the alveoli that can exchange gas. These are so thin uh, that if there's if there's pulmonary capillaries by them, you can exchange right through these tubes without going through an alveoli, according to Guyton anyway. Okay, and then of course we have the alveoli themselves, so those little sacs, super thin, uh, and they run, they are surrounded by capillaries, and so those two are touching together, but that's the main place where gas exchange occurred. But all three of these, called the respiratory unit. A respiratory unit. All right, respiratory bronchioles, we just said it's the first member. It's formed by splitting of the terminal bronchioles. We already said all this. Uh, have some alveoli growing off them. Mucus is the same. Uh, the mucus is the same as the terminal bronchial or the mucosa layer is the same, uh, except the only difference histologically is you're going to have holes in the mucosa layer because there has to be some alveoli coming off the respiratory bronchioles. Alveolar ducts uh, are next. So, so respiratory bronchioles split into alveolar ducts. But they're still ducts. They're still tube-like. Okay, so they're going to have more alveolar clusters coming off them. But at the distal part... Uh, so here's a here's a respiratory bronchial, and now that's going to split into an alveolar duct. So you might have maybe two coming off here. You're going to have more alveoli coming off here, but that's not what the key is. At the distal part of this alveolar duct, duct you're going to have a huge bundle of grapes, so to speak. And that's actually, these are all alveoli. They'll be coming out of the plane of the page at us and behind the plane of the page. It's just a whole sack filled with alveoli. And that's called the alveolar sac. Alveolar sac. All right, so here's, I don't know why I tried to draw, but here we go again. Repetition, repetition. It's good for you guys to learn can see this is still some smooth muscle hanging on. Um, so here's a terminal bronchial. How do I know it's terminal? Because I don't see an alveoli coming. How do I know this is a respiratory bronchial? See the alveoli coming off it, so it's a respiratory bronchial. That's going to split uh, into alveolar ducts. So here's a big alveolar duct. And we can follow this. The alveolar duct actually split. They can split several times. Uh, but at the very distal part, we have one of these giant kind of bunches of grapes. And that's the alve alveolar sac. And notice that these alveoli communicate with one another. They have holes. Alveolar holes here, alveolar pores. Um, so maybe this one gets clogged up with gunk or mucus. The air can just go out through this one. Uh, and so there's kind of kind of a system. Also note, look at how the capillaries, uh, the microcirculation, this is that microcirculation I talk about all the time in fifth, you know, earlier before the midterm stuff. Okay, so pretty neat. By the way, here's the pulmonary vein carrying oxygenated blood uh, away, and there's the pulmonary artery carrying deoxygenated blood, and see how those break in? They're, they break down into a arterial and the arterial turns into a capillary system. Then there's a venule, and the venule gets bigger, and then you have a pulmonary vein. So it's the same stuff we've already learned. Alveolar duct. So here's a real, it looks like just a big uh, magnification. I'm not sure if that's a, a uh, electron microscope or not. But these are all alveolar sacs here. You can see them all right next. This is a, I mean, this is an alveolar sac filled with alveoli. And here's a duct right in the middle of the alveolar duct. Notice we have some walls between these guys, too, some of them. See, they're sharing a wall. Those are called the alveolar septum. Alveolar septum. And there's there could be even smaller than we can see. There's 
could be capillaries even down between these things. Capillaries are everywhere like this. They just surround these pulmonary capillary system. Or the pulmonary microcirculation is just uh, around every one of these little grapes. The alveoli, major site of gas exchange between air and blood. Uh, Guyton says that the wall of the respiratory bronchial and alveoli can also exchange gas without an alveoli being there. So just the respiratory bronchial and alveolar duct, the tissue of that can do it. It's not the main route though. The alveoli are the smallest number or smallest member of the respiratory unit. And we said they can individually come off the respiratory bronchioles and respiratory duct, no problem. In fact, they have to by definition. And then there's the alveolar sacs that we already talked about. So this whole thing is an alveolar sac. What makes an alveolar sac? All these alveoli does. And there, where does the alveolar sac occur? It occurs at the distal end of the alveolar duct. Got it? About 20 million alveoli. All the books agree for once. Ross, uh, Junkira, chiropractic board book, Standring chiropractic board book, that's the Gray's Anatomy. That's the medical, Ross is the medical histology book. Junkira is the chiropractic. They all agree, it's a miracle. About 20 million alveoli in each lung. So you have, normally you have 400 million alveoli. And the, every one of them is surrounded by a nest of pulmonary capillaries. And many of them are separated by an alveolar septum. Not the ones coming off the the respiratory bronchial or the alveolar duct though. They're really small. They're 200 micrometers in diameter. Uh, they actually blow up like a balloon during inspiration and because there, there's some elastic tissue in there uh, in that alveolar septum uh, that squeezes them back together. So alveolar septum contains some elastic and reticular tissue or fiber in there that helps them kind of contract back during expiration. The reticular fiber also prevents them from collapsing or over expanding so it kind of it's like a pericardium in a way so to speak. What makes up its wall of the alveoli? Uh, they're mainly type 1 alveolar cells, strong aka Type 1 pneumocytes should be a star. If, you're, if I was testing you on this stuff, should I test you on this? No, because you've already had this, right? This should be an easy review. I won't this quarter. Uh, so mainly type 1. But there are really important type 2 alveolar cells. These are the guys who secrete the surfactant. These are also the guys who, who's got the world crazy right now. No, not COVID-19. That's the disease. Who's the bug? SARS-CoV-2. Where does it get into the body? Wherever these type 2 alveolar cells are. Now, there's receptors for this on the type 2 alveolar cells. And there's receptors in your conjunctive of your eye, but there's not. There, wherever the receptors are for this. There, who are the receptors? I already told you that should know who the receptors are for this. Yeah, but not ACE1, ACE2 receptors. ACE2 receptors are on type 2 alveolar cells. Anyway, I'm getting out of control. Uh, so the cell, there's, they're also covered by a delicate level of connective tissue. Let's take a look at them. Picture's always better. Oh, I forgot to talk about the macrophage in my slides. I wanted to talk about that. Um, oh well, I'll have to make a next edition of that. But the macrophage, it's kind of, it can clean debris. You ever wonder, how? what if you get gunk down here? What if you get super fine, like, silicon, a really fine asbestosis? What if you get things like that, that don't get stuck by the mucus? How do you get it out? There's no mucus escalator down here. These alveolar macrophages can literally eat stuff up, and then they migrate. Um, they migrate their way out and up uh, through the 
through the Asner system and through the tracheobronchial tree until they get up to the larynx. And it, they get kind of stuck up in the mucus escalator once they get above the respiratory uh, unit here. Uh, but they're actually very interesting little creatures. I had slides. I don't know why like, I didn't. I must have cut them out because I was trying to. I had like 150 slides. So I was trying to narrow this down. Anyway, that's not why we're here though. So we're looking at the alveolus. Who who are these type 1 cells? These are the type 1 cells. They did for whatever reason they didn't draw the the cells in here very good <laughs> or at all. Um, but these are all cells side by side and they're called type 1 alveolar cells. This is a type 2 alveolar cell that also makes up part of the alveolar cell membrane. This is the one who's secreting. See that light blue stuff? That's surfactant. And that, that decreases surface tension uh, so oxygen can diffuse right out of this red blood cell right into here. Or I'm sorry, carbon dioxide can diffuse out of there, no problem. Oxygen can diffuse. No transporters are needed. It can just go like a ghost right into there. So that's where the O2 goes. All right, um, okay, that's what I want to show you. But you can see the incredibly close relationship be these. There is this connective tissue. It's almost like an interstitium. There's the endothelium of the blood vessel. Uh, there's the outer single layer of the alveolus. And there's a little thin tissue layer in there between. All right, so I've already said all this. Type 1 alveolar cells, just simple squamous, run-of-the-mill, make up 95% of that wall. Um, they fuse with the, there's, the, there's Ross, there is a little layer of tissue in there, as was shown. They don't flat-out fuse. There is a layer of tissue because uh, they sit on a basal lamina is what, what this is. So this is actually basal lamina tissue right here. So alveolar, simple squamous, basal lamina, endothelium. That is, that's the really where respiration occurs right there. Okay. Type two cells we said they're secretory. Um, they make up only five percent of the wall. Uh, they do have. We went over this. There's that dreaded SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so they do have type 2 alveolar cells have ACE2 receptors so they can bind and the virus can be taken inside the cell and it can start cloning itself all over and over and over. can become a virus factory. And it secretes surfactant as we said. It's more complicated. There's actually four types of sur surfactant, uh, A, B, C, and D. And we're not going to go any deeper than that though. There are pro uh, progenitor cells. Uh, these ACE, these um, type 2 alveolar cells are also considered progenitor cells because they can, they're like a stem cell, they can morph via mitosis into a new type 1 cell or it can split itself. Maybe it's getting worn out and needs to make a new one of itself. So they can make type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells. So it's a very important cell. Surfactant, pulmonary surfactant, we talked about already. Um, it, cross, it reduces the surface tension, uh, which helps ventilation occur. Interestingly enough, those macros, those pneumomacrophages or alveolar macrophages, they can actually eat the surfactant if you get an over secretion of it. Um, but the type 2 pneumocytes can, if as they make new surfactant, they can take that old surfactant back up and recycle it. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. It also like decreases the tendency for the alveolus to collapse on itself. And as I said before, there are pores, alveolar pores, also called the pores of Kahn, that live in the alveolar sacs only. Uh, and they can they can talk. The gas can flow between them. If one of the kind of the alveolar openings gets clogged up, it can just go to the other alveoli and still work because of those. The respiratory membrane is nothing more than that 
simple squamous of the epithelium with the basal lamina with the endothelium of the capillary. So those are another three amigos. And collectively, that's called the pulmonary membrane or the respiratory membrane, and that is where gas exchange really occurs. This stuff we actually went over, so I don't know, I just left in here if other people are watching this, just for completeness. We get, talk about lungs, you have to talk about the pleural cavity. And so it's kind of like the pericardial cavity around the heart or the peritoneal cavity that's around the abdomen. Uh, and there's there's two membranes that form the pleural cavity. And they're both serous membranes, so they secrete serous fluid, just like the pericardium, just like the peritoneum. They, they're all serous membranes. Okay, so there's one that lines the thoracic cavity, and there's one that is stuck to the lungs. And that space in between the lungs and the thoracic cavity, that is the pleural cavity. Right, so the space between the two serous membranes makes the pleural cavity. Specifically, serous membrane that makes up the pleural cavities are drum roll, parietal pleura, and visceral pleura. Surprise, surprise. Just like the parietal peritoneum, visceral peritoneum. Or if you're peritoneum, parietal peritoneum, visceral peritoneum. Tomatoes, tomatoes. Uh, pericardium. There's a there's a pleural and a visceral serous pericardium as well. There's also a fibrous pericardium. Same same deal though, and they secrete fluid. So here's a nice little cartoon of a lung, and the cartoon, the visceral pleura is right there in black. That's visceral pleura. And there's the parent stuck to the chest cavity wall in black right there, and the exaggerated space between them that is the that is the pleural cavity and that's super important there's about 50 cc's of serous fluid that live in this cavity okay there's another another view of it right who cares about that i always like this picture uh, so if you deflate the lungs you can still see there's the the parent on the chest back chest wall that's the parietal Pleura, uh, and then the shiny stuff. See how this is kind of shiny? It's super thin. That is the visceral pleura, and the space would be the pleural cavity. Notice there's a mediastinum. This is the mediastinum, right? The middle region where the heart is. Uh, so there's kind of a medial stinal part of the pleural. Oh, there it is. Even mediastinal part of the pleural cavity here. Uh, and there's a diaphragmatic part down here that's stuck to the, the diaphragms. Okay, so normally about 50 cc's of serous fluid, very slippery. What does it do? Why is it in there? It decreases friction. The lungs are breathing all the time, so that decreases any friction. And we've already talked about it. I took all these slides out because we've already talked about this. You can actually, if you dig through my... Professor Doug's lecture page, you can find all the lectures on this in CVPP. Uh, but we talked about if that serous fluid builds up to more than 50 cc's, you start to get what's called a hydrothorax. All right? And if the hydrothorax gets crazy big, it can actually compress the lung tissue and push the lung in. That's a compression atelectasis that has occurred because of that. And here's a little cartoon. Uh, so this patient had cancer, or has cancer, I don't, I don't know if this hypothetical patient's still alive. Let's say they had chemo and they beat, they beat the cancer. But while they had the cancer, it, they, it metastasized into the lungs, specifically into the, the pleura here of the lungs. And if this is infected with cancer cells, the body fights it. There's an inflammatory process and juice starts flowing out, plus the cells are irritated and when cells irritated, they either quit doing what they're doing or they get upset and they overdo what they're doing and they're making way too much pleural fluid. And this patient can't breathe because it's caused a compression atelectasis. How do you fix that? You go to the hospital and you stick a tube in here down at the costophrenic angles and you drain it out. Simple as that. And then all of a sudden they can breathe again because the lung is no longer compressed. Fun facts about the pleural cavity. 
the visceral and parietal pleura are continuous at the hyla of the lungs. The pleural cavity has negative pressure, just like inside the tubes of the lungs do. Okay. Um, it's why doesn't it collapse then? Because the lung is always pulling in, and it's attached to the lung, so uh, that's what keeps it open because of the elastic recoil or the kind of the like what would what would that be a black hole? How it sucks matter into it. Same kind of deal. The lungs are sucking and pulling, so it keeps it open that way. There's three parts if you want to get technical. There's the we looked at the mediastinal part and the diaphragmatic part, and the costal part is the main part of the uh, the pleural cavity. All right, saved the important one for last here. Here's the mucous escalator. It's called the mucociliary clearance system. Let's take a look at this thing. Super, super important. Smokers lose theirs. That's why they're hacking up, coughing stuff up all the time because they lose theirs because of the cigarette smoke. But if you're not a smoker and you have normal pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, uh, you'll have a mucus escalator. And it's very good at trapping bugs, viruses, and bacteria, cigarette smoke, uh, ash, smoke, which we have sm smoke. California has been so weird, I'm going to digress. Never in my 60 years of life, well, maybe I wasn't, I mean, if I'm just born, I don't know if I could, but never have I ever seen what's going on here in the Bay Area. It's literally, it's not as bad a day, but yesterday it was literally, it wasn't like nighttime, but it was twilight all day. You had to have your headlights on. I drove to work to Milpitas. It wasn't quite as bad here in Gilroy, but when I got over the hill and in the San Jose, I'm like, oh my God, it's like, it's one in the afternoon. And it's like, had all the cars had their headlights on because of all the fires. We had a lightning storm come through and started hundreds of fires and it's just so much smoke that and the weird thing is it doesn't smell it didn't smell that smoky yesterday but the air was just like a nuclear winter I guess some people would say anyway I digress let's get back on track here so mucociliary clearance system yes yeah, it's, it's gonna clear all that gunk out there's three major components of the system the cilia super important and then we have two types of uh, mucus. One's more of a serous fluid, but we have a thick mucus on the top and a thin layer of serous fluid. You could call it a mucus, I guess, but it's more like a serous fluid. Still sticky, but not super sticky. That's called the gel layer. Picture's going to be great here. Let's look at the picture right now. So I love this picture. So here's the... You pick, you pick it. How about... Um, how about the right superior lobar bronchus? I mean, anywhere in tracheobronchial tree, up, up, not the micro, not way down to the bronchioles, but anywhere up high, you got this system working. So you have two layers. You have thick, sticky flypaper mucus on the top, and then you have a more serous type kind of, uh, not a... a th it's still sticky, but it's not crazy sticky. It's thinner, more, uh, less viscous mucus down here. And these hairs are beating together, pushing this this way toward the larynx. Right? And this is sticky enough that it, it sticks to the super sticky flypaper-like mucus. This is so sticky that it catches bugs and pollen and... and burnt pine trees it's caught all that stuff and as the day goes by and if you're sleeping at night this stuff is moving up toward the larynx and here's the bugs getting up the mucus escalator system and then when it, when it gets up in your larynx all of a sudden you can feel the gagging reflex and you can <clears throat> you can either clear your throat and you can get it up into the larynx you can have a choice you can push it through the epiglottis, you can either spit it out or expectorate it, or you can swallow it. Um, but either way, it's out of the tracheobronchial tree. 
And uh, the trick is to make sure this serous layer stays nice and thin. When we talked about cystic fibrosis, remember the CTRF channels? Those are super important. They secrete chloride and sodium and water follow. So it's a very important that the water gets into this layer to make it thin. Kind of getting off my slides, aren't I? Uh, so this saw layer and gel layer, gel is like gel thick, like hair gel. Saw is thin, like a solution or I don't know how to remember that. But there's an AKA the periciliary fluid layer. I'm not sure if I would, if I was writing a board question, I wouldn't say that because it's peri means around, cilia means it's around the cilia, so I would immediately think, oh, it's this green one here. I'd probably call it the saw layer. Um, but it's made of a, a serous fluid, it's not a mucus, even though some texts do describe it as a mucus, right? This, this author described it as a mucus. That's how I originally learned it as a thin mucus, but... Uh, this author says no, it's a more of a serous fluid. It's secreted by run-of-the-mill ciliatus, uh, just the the epithelial layer and the mucosal layer. Uh, the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells are the ones who secrete this serous fluid. This this epithelium is also studded with this CFTR, these CFTR channels, which we've talked about a lot when we talked about cystic fibrosis more of the GI system but same kind of deal here these channels are very important they spit they allow chloride ion to pass into the serous fluid and then sodium follows that and water follows that and so you dilute this serous mucousy fluid and you gotta have that people with cystic fibrosis the CT, uh, CFTR channels are broken this just becomes one sticky mess and the escalator system is broken and the bugs multiply and multiply and multiply and they go into here and they invade the wall of the trachea or wherever we're talking about I guess we're talking about the lobar bronchus uh, and you get a wicked inflammation and you can get a pneumonia going on with that that's what usually kills people with cystic fibrosis is pneumonia it's not actually the cystic fibrosis that kills them. It's the sequelae of the cystic fibrosis. All right, uh, the gel layer, we said it's just flat out sticky mucus. It sits on the top of the periciliary fluid layer and it traps like fly paper. 90 per, it's still highly water, it's 96% water. And people with cystic fibrosis, this gets incredibly, uh, incredibly thick and sticky too. There's two main cell types. There's really four, but I cut it down to two. The big ones who contribute are the goblet cells and the mucus cells are the ones who make mucus. They make mucin and it combines with water to form mucus. Goblet cells make up 18% of the tracheobronchial epithelium. Um, they're found all the way up to, all the way down to about the 12th division of the tracheobronchial tree. So they secrete mucus and glycoproteins uh, if you have an inflammatory condition of the tracheobronchial tree, like an infection, the goblet cells can get upset and they secrete so much mucus that it can't be watered down. Those CFTR channels can't keep up and it gets tenaciously thick. And it can you can get a mucus plug and you can call get another type of atelectasis called the resorption atelectasis. And I think we'll actually get to that during our one lecture. We got one lecture to do pulmonary. That's why you gotta get you gotta watch this stuff on your own. So the twelfth layer would be right about here. So the goblet cells are everywhere, not in the trachea though, but starting in the bronchial tree. And most of the bronchioles are studded with goblet cells, but they disappear uh, once you get in the medium-sized bronchioles and beyond. So there's no goblet cells from this point on. No goblet cells, no mucus from those anywhere. Submucosal glands. Uh, that is wherever there's cartilage, there's submucosal glands, and they secrete mucus. The concept, we're almost done, concept of pulmonary edema, so most of you, I think we've talked about this when we talked about uh, the heart problems. But let's go over this again. 
So here's the microcirculation. Now we know what this is. So this is the alveolus. There's the simple squamous type 1 alveolar cells. There's not even a type 2, but there should be at least one type 2 in here. I'll draw it. Uh, but nevertheless, there's the basal lamina, and there's the endothelium. There's the respiratory membrane, right? These three guys right here. So everybody's happy. But now you get a beaver dam up here. You come, when you take this class, you learn all about beaver dams. Um, so the beaver dam could be heart failure. It could be a valve that doesn't open good. How about tricuspid valve stenosis? How about mitral valve stenosis? You pick the beaver dam. But if the heart can't pump and process blood fast enough, you're going to get a backup of blood. And it's going to in, back up into here, into the microcirculation. And it's going to increase the pressure to the point where the red blood cells are actually going to start leaking into the alveolus. That's pulmonary edema. First it pushes just the blood fluid out and it over floods this kind of makeshift uh, interstitium. This is still the interstitium. Uh, but pretty soon the, this blood fluid starts dripping in here and you could even get red blood cells going in there later if it gets bad enough. But it's mainly the blood fluid. It's really interstitial fluid that's coming in here. Um, but here's a aortic stenosis and we get a huge backup and that causes pulmonary edema. It also causes pulmonary hypertension, I guess, comes first because you got so much pressure in here. But that's pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension will cause pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema uh, will get into the blood and you'll you get a pink, frothy sputum. It's classic for pulmonary edema. It's got a few of the red blood cells have snuck in here making it like a pink color. And you, you cough it up or spit it up. That's called hemoptysis. And then we know, I mean, this story goes to the heart, right? Here's the here's the right heart. That's a terrible heart, isn't it? Um, but the right heart over here is the one who's got a pump. That's a just terrible. <laughs> Time to quit. We're almost done. Well, that's my weird pulmonary trunk. It's an inverted pulmonary trunk it's supposed to be up here, right? But nevertheless, you get the idea. The backup is going to go right through here, and it's going to the right heart is going to try. It's going to get stretched out because the backup of blood in here. It's going to try to overcome this, but it can't, so it wrecks itself. Uh, and that's not called coropulmonale. Is that cor called coropulmonale? My students better not mess that one up. No. Corpulmonale has to mean the beaver dam is from the microcirculation itself, like COPD will cause this to get all scarred up and pinched off, and the right heart still it's still a beaver dam. The right heart has trouble pumping blood through that. That'll wreck the right heart, and that's called uh, corpulmonale, which means right heart failure secondary to a lung condition. Everything I just said. All right, we did it. And hope, hopefully this was all an easy review for you. And we will see you later.